Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, for a, for a very um, warm and, and thoughtful welcome. And in fact, for me personally, um, not only is this a, a great pleasure because it's a chance to come to New York City again after the pandemic, it's also a chance to put myself into dialogue with two of the uh, figures on the East Coast with whom I feel I have a particular affinity. Uh, and I'm thinking, of course, of both Bruce, Bruce himself, but also Ilya Klieger of the Slavic Department at NYU, all of whom, in fact, or both of whom have been engaged in the question of thinking through the relationship between uh, uh, sovereignty as a political concept and the kind of work, both anthropological and literary or aesthetic, that sovereignty performs uh, as a symbolic act. And that's precisely the moment that I want to enter into the conversation. So I'm very much hoping for a, uh, after speaking for about 15 minutes to an hour, that there'll be a kind of triangulated conversation between Bruce Grant, uh, Ilya Klieger and myself over this particularly interesting moment, which is the uh, late in Russian enlightenment as it slowly drifts into the, um, uh, the romantic era. And my desire essentially is to return to this pre-romantic, pre-Pushkinian moment in Russian literary production in order to excavate what might still be a relevant and interesting and possibly even vital about uh, several texts, one of which is still widely read. Uh, the other two, in fact, have been largely forgotten and relegated to the, you know, the, the ancillary byways of, of Russian literature. Um, so this paper is taken from the second chapter of my book project, The Geopoetics of Sovereignty, Enlightenment, Romanticism, and the Russian-Georgian Encounter. And my book is motivated by the fact that remarkably little theoretical or theoretically informed work has been done in the field of literary studies to illuminate what I call the Russian-Georgian Encounter. Uh, even as nuanced historical and ethnographic anthropological studies of the Caucasus region continue to be produced. So this fact, I think, seems all the more surprising given the fact that the cross-fertilization between uh, an ascendant Russian culture, often identified with modernity itself, and its often beleaguered Georgian counterpart is widely acknowledged by both Russians and Georgians alike to have been among the most aesthetically productive, if politically fraught, to have taken place in the former Russian empire, indeed in the Soviet Union. Uh, what my book seeks to do is to place political and anthropological articulations of the principles of sovereignty, um, into a dialogue with what might be called the historical transition from the Enlightenment to Romanticism. Um, first theorized in the modern era, sovereignty has been con conventionally understood to designate the supreme authority residing in the state, as well as the political and legal uh, uh, independence of geographically separate states. The principle of sovereignty has been key to prolonged and arguably incomplete transition away from a model of political authority that was regarded as divinely ordained and embodied in the ruling monarch towards a secular model of statehood. Common to both older and newer understandings of sovereignty then is a distinction between figure and ground. Whether the figure be the ruling monarch or the state, the ground is regarded as the constituent power of the political itself which derives its force from an inaugural act of symbolization. Although mostly identified with the force of divine sanction or social contract, the same constituent power of symbolization is also at work in art and literature. In the context of feudal relations or the absolute state, the symbolic force of art is normally seen to, to, to be ancillary to political power, all too often serving as its cultural legitimation. Russian 18th century texts, however, um, uh, devoted to the Caucasus reflected the enlightenment stated goals of cataloging a natural and human diversity, celebrating the civilizing mission and advocating self-discipline as a means of mitigating the effects of absolutist power. At the same time, in colliding with the refractory realities of newly incorporated peoples and territories, these texts also dramatized the need for alternative modes of symbolization. In anthropological terms, they express sovereignty in the mode of reciprocal, if asymmetrical exchange in the form of gifts, tribute or sacrifice about which Bruce Grant has of course written a great deal, 
rather than as the coercive in imposition of external authority. Moreover, in addressing the Caucasus as a, as a physical geography, Russian literature evolved from natural scientific and Baroque allegorical modes of representation to newer, properly aesthetic notions of landscape. The first half of my book then is dedicated to what I would call a rationalist and voluntarist understanding of sovereign power as it strives to tabulate and dominate the world. While the second half relates the rise of what I call geopoetics, the poetics of the land. In Russia, literary romanticism coincided with the transformative discovery of the Caucasus as an alpine landscape, one that offered the poetic imagination a new ground or source of inspiration. This Russian story serves as, for me, the dialectical counterpoint to the Georgian, which evolved under conditions of ever diminishing sovereignty, and the Armenian, in which sovereignty has been ex had been extinguished entirely, such that the symbolic function of homeland coexisted alongside the experience of deterritorialization as well as diasporic mobility. Today, what I'd like to do is examine three thematically related Caucasian texts. Uh, the Russian poet Gavrila Dirjavin's On the Return of Count Zubov to, from Persia of 1797, uh, which is relatively well known, and two much less known texts. Firstly, secondly, by the Russophone Ukrainian Vasily Naryezhny's The Black Year or The Mountain Princes, possibly composed in 1816, 1817, and Harutyun Araratyan's Life and Adventures ostensibly written in Armenian, and I can explain why I, mention, I say ostensibly uh, in the Q&A, but published in Russian in 1813. These three texts written by a, a Russian, a Russian from Ukrainian and an Armenian, uh, constitute nothing less than the earliest extended Russian language literary representations of the Caucasus. And my goal today is to discuss them as literary works which explore the problem of conquest, power and sovereignty, on a shifting and contested terrain. The first, Gavrila Derjavit's Ode to Count Zubov, was written in 1797 in response to an aborted Russian campaign to con conquer the South Caucasus, a belated chapter in Catherine the Great's so-called Greek project, truncated by her death. As such, it constitutes an important literary reflection on the transition from Iranian to Russian hegemony in the South Caucasus at the close of the 18th century, even as it also elaborates the strategies by which Russia's state servitors might negotiate the challenges of working under the constraints of 18th century absolutism. Dzerzhavin, should be noted, uh, never visited the Caucasus. His exceptionally vivid evocation of the region, the first in Russian literature, owes much to the wider European discovery of the of Alpine scenery as the object of aesthetic contemplation. The second text I wish to explore is Vasily Naryezhny's little known novel, Shorni Got, The Black Year, or The Mountain Princes, as I mentioned, possibly composed in 1816 to 17. It's also a complex literary refraction of Naryezhny's own year long sojourn in the Caucasus, where he served from 1802 to 1803 as secretary to the district police commissioner in the province Uyezd of Lodi, whose administration was then based in Tiflis. Unlike Dirjavin, Naryezhny witnessed firsthand the lawlessness and endemic corruption which, based, uh, which beset the first Russian administration of Georgia established in the immediate aftermath of its annexation under Lieutenant General Karl von Knoring and his civilian, civilian counterpart, Kovalensky. Even as it elides any mention of Russia or Russian rule, set instead in a uh, fictional and ahistorical North Caucasus governed by competing local fiefdoms, Nareshny's novel derives from the multiple genres of 18th century European letters, most notably the Conte philosophique, an allegorical genre which permitted the trenchant critique of social customs, religious prejudices, and modes of government whose provenance was generally project projected onto a remote and exotic region. This geographical displacement, amply evident, for example, in Swift's Gulliver Travels or Voltaire's Histoire Orientale Zadig of 1747, had the double advantage of evading censorship and establishing a literary kinship with the fairy tale and the adventure novel, thereby obscuring the immediate object of its satirical intent. Finally, Araratyan's Life and Adventures reads as part autobiography, part picaresque adventure novel. It narrates the vicissitudes of an itinerant Armenian whose survival depends on his ability to juggle multiple allegiances, both local and imperial. Despite their generic differences, 
Then, these works by Dirjarin, Narizhnin, Araratyan reflect a shared moment in political and in cultural history, during which the, the ideals of enlightened absolutism collided with the realities of warfare, diplomacy, and colonial governance. Culturally, I want to suggest they, they point to the never full, 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 fully realized possibilities of a briefly lived pre-romantic or properly enlightenment poetics governing literary representations of the Caucasus, which offered an entirely distinct staging of the relationship between state sovereignty and the disciplinary modes intended to represent the ruler and govern the ruled. Let me now turn to the first of my texts, Gabriela Dirjavin's O to Zubov. The poet Dirjavin can be credited with inaugurating the, the Caucasian theme in modern Russian letters. His innovations in this respect, I would suggest, are twofold. Firstly, his two Caucasian poems, like many others by him, were addressed not to the ruling sovereign, but to one of her, her noble servitors. Secondly, the Caucasus was depicted for the very first time in Russian letters as a landscape discernible by the human senses, no less than as a terrain of conquest. In other words, Dzerzhavin's poetry heralded the emergence in Russia of a biographically concrete lyric subject encountering a tangible sens sensory world, even as his rise to fame coincided historically with the consolidation of the compact between the empress and the Russian gentry, which culminated in the charter to the nobility of 1765. The work of a poet functionary, Dijon's verse, verse mirrored what Mark Ryef called the ambiguous nature of the 18th century Russian nobility, whose, I quote, service orientation precluded a determined effort to loosen the reins of autocracy but whose most enlightened representatives were encouraged, encouraged to cultivate a new sense of interiority and moral responsibility. For this very reason, Dirjavin the poet must be read as dialectically related to Dirjavin the noble functionary, not merely because in the 18th century, both vocations were determined to varying degrees by relations of patronage, but because the contemplative detachment which poetry offered would become an increasingly important resource for gentry writers, even as the patronal favor to be gained by odic praise became ever less palatable. Dijavin's autobiographical notes detail the travails of a man caught between an inflexible sense of propriety and the perennial struggle for professional advancement in the face of bureaucratic impediments and petty rivalries. As a state servitor in the provinces, Dijavin internalized the principles of uh, enlightened uh, absolutism, I quote, swearing to enact the uh, uh, laws of the sovereign power and of no one else in the course of his duties un until his ever greater proximity to court life made it painfully clear to him that I quote, Catherine ran the state and even the administration of justice politically on the basis of her own agenda rather than the sacred truth, such that he became unable to write practically anything in her praise with a clear and passionate heart, end of quote. Dijon's ambivalent involvement, loyalist, yet critical in the stakes of power, led him on occasion to write poems to Catherine's grandees, some enjoying proximity to the throne, others languishing in disgrace. As current or former beneficiaries and dispensers of royal favor and executives of imperial strategy, these men were living test cases of the possibilities as well as the limits of statesmanship in an absolutist state. A case in point was Valerian Zubov, 1777 to 1804, who secured a series of military assignments culminating in his command of the Persian campaign of 1796 at the tender age of 25. Needless, needless to say, he was good looking and that was certainly one of the, I think, major attractions for Catherine. Zubov's expeditionary force was in fact tasked with a far grander mission, that of seizing control of nothing less than all the trade routes between Iran and Tibet, after which he had been ordered to march on Istanbul itself. As was the case, uh, with Russian strategic ambitions, then as today, the South Caucasus figured only as part of a much wider geopolitical ambit. In, in, the, in this case, the closing chapter of Catherine's grandiose Greek project, which sought nothing less than the resurrection of Byzantium under Russian auspices. Relying on diplomacy more than warfare, Zubov succeeded within a sh few short months in winning over pliable local potentates over a considerable uh, stretch of territory from Dagestan to modern Azerbaijan. No sooner were Zubov's nominal victories gained, however, than they fell victim to dramatic changes in the Russian capital. The Empress Catherine died in November, just as Zubov was poised to cross into Iran. Determined to undo his deceased mother's 
policies, the newly ascended Tsar, Paul I, abruptly recalled Zubov's troops without informing Zubov himself, thereby ending his campaign and leaving him exposed on enemy soil. Ordered to, return to, uh, to retire to his estates in the Baltic, with all the territories he had annexed restored to Iran, Zubov remained a persona non grata until the closing months of the Emperor Paul's brief reign. At once, unexpe unexpectedly successful and utterly futile, Valerian Zubov's expedition of 1796 to the South Caucasus starkly revealed the geopolitical ambitions and the structural limitations of Russian absolutism. Composed at a time when Zubov was being actively persecuted, the German's principal poem to Zubov was thus a significant vindication of the author's independence of judgment, one that prompted Pushkin some years later to say the following. Without, with, while boasting of fewer major talents than other nations, our literature stands apart for its refusal to bear the stamp of obsequious civility. Our most talented writers carry themselves with a sense of nobility and independence. The voice of flattery fell silent with Dirjavin. So, and, and Pushkin in writing these particular lines is in fact quoting and referencing precisely the poem that we're, we're now about to look at. So what is it about this poem that uh, takes us well beyond the Caucasus to becoming this kind of major ringing affirmation of something like uh, the autonomy of the aesthetic? This affirmation of artistic independence constitutes a cultural trajectory I propose briefly to examine here as an unexpected corollary to Russia's conquest of the Caucasus. On the return of Count Zubov to, from Persia unfolds, to put it very simply, at the intersection of two symbolic narratives. The first narrative is the external trajectory of Zubov's life of military service to the Russian monarchy, while the second narrative is an internal quest for what might be called a sovereign self. That is to say, something like the ethical or spiritual foundations of personality. These two narratives are clearly contrasted, but also mutually imbricated, and they anticipate much of what would come to constitute Russia's so-called Caucasian theme over the course of a century from Lermontov to Tolstoy. In the poem, the hero's internal quest functions as a didactic frame within which Zubov's external trajectory is elaborated, the latter constituting the poem's four central stanzas. Neglecting to offer any meaningful account of Zubov's ephemeral victories, Stanzas five to eight of the poem, and I'll read them in a minute, uh, focus instead on scenic vistas of the Caucasus region, the first such extended depiction in Russian literature of the Caucasus. Now, Dirjavin would have certainly had access to a small but significant body of expeditionary literature, authored by, primarily by German scholars commissioned by the Russian Academy of Sciences to tabulate the natural scientific ethnographic and strategic military interest of the Caucasus. For example, Johann Güldenstitz, Reisen durch Russland und im Kaukasischen Gebirge of 1787 to 1791, or the then recently published account of botanist Johann Jakob Lerchers, Travels to Persia of 1746. And in chapter one of my book, I actually look at these expeditionary narratives for the work they do in, in combining military with often natural scientific uh, description of the region. But the lines that we're about to look at, and which you see on the screen before you, are in fact somewhat dis di distinct in their orientation and purpose. They are in fact, first and foremost, a, an elaborate literary exercise whose cognitive value is entirely secondary to its uh, uh, allegorical poetic import. And for the sake of time, I think I'll probably just read the English out to you loudly, aloud to you. Uh, oh, young leader, in waging your campaigns, you have marched through the Caucasus with your soldiery. You have gazed upon the horrors, the beauties of nature, the angry rivers pouring forth here, there from the ribs of terrifying mountains, uh, roaring into the gloom of abysses, the snows from there, the, the hills browse thunderously falling, having lain there for, for whole centuries. The chamois, they have their horns lowered, watching calmly in the gloom below them, uh, the birth of lightning and thunder. You have seen during fair weather, the sun's rays there among the ice, playing, reflecting in the waters, displaying a magnificent view. You have seen the light rain glowing there, scattering in sprays of many colors. You have seen a block of amber gray ice there, suspended overhead, gazing into the dark wood, and a golden scarlet dawn there, delighting the gaze as it appears through the forest. This is some of the most fabulous poetry of the late, I think, 18th century in Russia. 
Now, prior to Dirjavin, nature had enjoyed a somewhat circumscribed place in Russian letters. The representations of the natural world reflected either the classicist conventions of pastoral verse with its idealization of rural life or the Baroque poetics of wonder, which projected nature's primal magnificence onto, vaster, onto a vaster canvas with the aim of stirring the passions and redirecting their unleashed energies towards a preconceived end. By contrast, the focuses of the Zubov poem is all movement and variation, susceptible to dramatic shifts in weather, season, and topography, and eminently available into the human gaze. Uneven, irregular, and constantly metamorphosing, Dirjavin's Caucasus was nonetheless anything but arbitrary. Indeed, its visual details mirror a reconfiguration of nature itself, which was taking place in the emerging field of European aesthetics. And I'm thinking here, not merely of the sublime, but in fact, the way in which the sublime and the beautiful are uh, colliding at this particular point as aesthetic categories and being in some ways mediated and reconciled by a third category, which is the picturesque. If, um, as, um, um, if as um, the British architect Sir Christopher Wren had observed in the 1670s, beauty, beauty was ideally to be found in the harmony of objects, geometrical figures being naturally more beautiful than, uh, than any other ir irregular, then mountains posed a particular challenge to the eye. In other words, mountains could not be beautiful because quite simply they were jagged, right? They were uneven, they were irregular. Uh, so mountains posed a particular challenge since in the words of influential 17th century theologian Thomas Burnett, there is nothing in nature more shapeless and ill-figured than an old rock or mountain, end of quote. It would become the task of the subsequent generations of Englishmen undertaking the grand tour of Europe to cultivate and foster a new taste for alpine scenery, recognizing in mountainous landscape a capacity to engender both horror and beauty, ujus and krasata, right, in uneven and hence unexpected ways. And here you have uh, two quick quotes there to give you an example. In 1705, for example, uh, Joseph Addison speaks of alpine vistas broken in so many shape, st uh, steps and precipices that they fill the mind with an agreeable kind of horror. While in 1765, Thomas Gray wrote of the Scottish Highlands that the mountains are ecstatic. None but those monstrous creatures of God know how to join uh, so much beauty with so much horror. So the rise of alpine scenery is clearly an important uh, moment in, in my story. And it has to do with, of course, the, um, the emergence of aesthetics itself and the transformation of these categories that were formerly understood in purely rhetorical terms into properly aesthetic categories. And in fact, one could argue that it's, it's primarily Nikolai Karamzin and his letters to of a Russian traveler that make these uh, translations of categories available to a Russian reader. In the book itself, I do a lot more work looking at the intertext that would, would have been available to Dirjavin, not only, for example, um, earlier uh, works by Kharaskov and Lomonos, but also, for example, more recent translations of British poets, such as Young, Edward Young, Edmund Young, uh, who, uh, whose works were being published in Russian and who actually function alongside the, the poetry of Ossian as a kind of new mode through which uh, landscape can be represented. Uh, so the German Ode, I think, clearly displays a kind of a citational awareness of the transformations that are being wrought by contemporary aesthetic experience in the sensory realm. And so we have, on the one hand, this kind of older, what we might call Baroque sense of cosmogonic dynamism, right, which is amply present in the, in the poem's vertical axis, with its avalanches and storms and precipitous streams. But you also have uh, more properly painterly possibilities, such as the subtle effects of chiaroscuro, the chromatic spectrum of refracted light that we normally associate with the picturesque, right, and which produces a kind of agreeable horror, right. So uh, in, in the larger chapter, I, in fact, what, I'm, what I in fact argue is that this poem is in a profoundly uh, meaningful way, but historically and aesthetically a kind of transitional text, right? One that on the one hand looks back onto the Baroque poetics, but is also at the same time looking forward to a not yet fully ripe sense of a romantic aesthetics of landscape. And it's precisely this kind of moment of hesitation that allows us to situate this form 
as a, as a text of the 1790s. Uh, in other words, it's not quite a Stimmungslandschaft, right? A, 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 a landscape of mood, but rather uh, something around, uh, uh, something related much more to allegory. And in fact, it's allegory that I now wish to turn to, which is of course also the title of my talk. Uh, so the Jabin's corpus, as I want to suggest, is in fact not really ultimately a landscape in the newer romantic sense, but rather uh, an instance of a kind of axis, an abstract axis that serves to mediate between the subject and the object. And in this case, uh, that's, that axis is going to be none other than the figure of fortuna or fortune or luck, right? And the, the relevant lines from the poem are the following. And then I, I, I jump to the, uh, the, the uh, lower section of the poem. Right? Now, what's represented here essentially is uh, two things, right? On the one hand, um, a middle path, right? The Serednia Stizia, uh, which is in fact essentially a translation of the Horatian model of uh, the golden mean, aurea mediocritas, right? Into uh, a Russian idiom, right? Um, and which, which contrasts with this kind of gyrating wheel of fortune. Now, these lines in the Groth edition of 1865, which uh, Dirjavid had, of course, a hand in, even though he had by that point already uh, passed away. Uh, in the Groth edition, this particular uh, uh, poem is preceded by what was called a vignette, a vignette, right? And you see it here on the screen on your, on your right. Drawn at the author's behest and carefully curated by him, it appeared only posthumously like all the, the illustrations Dirjavid had commissioned for his poems, right? Now, what's really interesting about this illustration is, of course, that you don't, the caucuses are nowhere to be seen, right? In fact, Dirjavin had the option of actually illustrating this poem with a actual representation of the Caucasus Mountains, and he rejected it for this entirely uh, Baroque classicist uh, uh, representation that you see. Uh, so what's going on? To the right, we see what appears to be the goddess Minerva, right? The goddess of war, as well as wisdom, identifiable by her helmet, her spear, and her peplos. While on the right, a young hero, possibly Hercules, identifiable by his club. Both stand side by side on cracked or jagged terrain, gazing intently upon each other, while the hands of the goddess point to the only dynamic aspect of the vignette, a putto or cherub blowing a gust of wind at a winged wheel, uh, leaning or rolling at a tilt on the lower right-hand corner. These two principal protagonists might equally be identified, of course, with the Empress Catherine, who had been depicted repeatedly during her reign as the goddess Minerva, most notably by Stefano Torelli in 1770 and again in 1772, and Valerian Zubov, whose youth, good looks, and courage in battle uh, had won Catherine's gushing approbation. Dzerzhavin himself left a note clarifying the drawing's import as follows, and the quote is given to you on the left. A gust of some kind of wind has propelled the wheel of fortune to the bottom of the mountain. Reason, razum, uh, points to the occurrence of this frequent phenomenon. But courage, mujusva, embracing wisdom, primodrist, looks with indifference at this random event. End of quote. Dirjan's gloss transforms the illustration and with it the poem as a whole into an allegory. An allegory of the cardinal virtues of fortitude and prudence, which together succeed in prev prevailing over fickle lady luck. Zubov's true journey for Dirjavid was this inward quest for self mastery, self sovereignty, if you will, right? The, equ the equanimity needed in the face of life's sudden uh, reversals, of which the Persian campaign of 1795 was merely one spectacular instance. The political conquest of the Caucasus and the aesthetic challenge of the Caucasian landscape are both ultimately subsumed by Dirjavin's quest for an internal sovereignty of the self. Dirjavin's poem to Zubov then asked to be read as one of many comparable works by, by the poet whose destinies were shaped by the tension characteristic of absolutism between raison d'etat and mon monarchical caprice. Its uniqueness lying in the fact that it situates Dirjavin's lifelong inner quest alongside a masterfully vivid and new representation of the landscape. Um, if the poem's didactic goal is self-mastery, the means it offers to achieve this end is not the aesthetic experience of landscape for the sensations it affords, but the moral contemplation of terrain. 
from the Caucasus Mountains to the Caspian Sea as a series of allegorical signs. So that's my first part of my story in which I suggest that sovereignty here emerges as a kind of allegorical principle that on the one hand appears to be pointing towards sovereign power, uh, the monarchy itself, but at the same time is also becoming introjected or internalized as a new kind of ethical discourse, right? That is emerging in Russian literature at this particular point, although it has its roots in different kinds of spiritual and moral practices going back to the mid 18th century. Now, if, for, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to talk much more briefly about two more texts uh, that I want to put into a conversation with Dirjavin. And my point here is quite consciously to put a very canonical text like Dirjavin's owed into a conversation with these more forgotten texts, significantly written not so much by members of the, the who, who, who stood at the pinnacle of the Russian elite as Dirjavin did in the 1790s, but more marginal figures, Nadezhny, who of course is a member of the uh, impoverished Ukrainian nobility serving in the imperial bureaucracy, uh, and uh, uh, Ararakyan, an entirely intriguing and enigmatic figure of whom more in a minute. So the second text I wish to explore is Vasily Nadezhny's little-known novel, The Black Year, or The Mountain Princes. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, unlike Tirishavan, what's interesting about Nadezhny's book is that it's the product, however mediated, of his own experience as a first-hand witness to the very inaugural period of Russian colonial rule in the Caucasus, specifically Georgia. What's curious about the novel is that it essentially elides any mention of not just Georgia, but indeed of Russia and Russian rule. And it's said, in fact, in a kind of fictional, dare I say, allegorical North Caucasus that are governed, that is governed by competing local fiefdoms. Uh, and one could argue in many ways that Nadezhny's novel essentially derives from multiple um, 18th century genres of, of which I mentioned the Conte Philosophique, but also the picaresque novel, which of course has an even earlier tradition. Uh, but what I think is interesting about both Zirjavin's text and Nariyashni's is that they both in fact share this particular moment in Russian cultural history, where uh, which point not only to the very beginnings of Russian political hegemony in the Caucasus, but also in fact to um, the, the moment in which the ideals of enlightened absolutism are, uh, are in a sense experiencing kind of internal uh, crevices or cracks, right? Now, this novel essentially functions or was written or designed as, as um, in, in terms of a genre that in fact has multiple roots in both the Near East as well as Europe, going back in fact to antiquity. And it's a term, it, the term that's generally used in English is a mirror for princes. That is to say, it's a kind of didactic manual uh, intended for younger members of, of the royal family in order to groom them for enlightened rule, right? The, the German term that's often used is Fürstenspiegel. And this Fürstenspiegel is in fact expounded in the first person by a young Ossetian prince, and so there's some nominal, nominal reference here to the North Caucasus, a prince named Kaituk, whose initial act on gaining the throne is to dismiss as false superstitions the ominous portents uh, the, uh, that are manifested at his birth, hence the Chornigot, the Black Year of the title. But subsequently, he spurns the advice of, of all his mentors, the royal priest. He, expresses the, he expels the emissary of the largest regional power, improbably, in fact, an emissary from the Lama of Tibet, um, and chooses instead to trust his opportunistic vizier, who in, who in turn indulges his worst impulses. In other words, this is a story of power gone mad, right? An unbridled ambition that shatters the idyllic state of primitive man uh, uh, and trusts the hero, the prince, into a series of misadventures from his expulsion uh, from his native land to violent conflicts with various outside forces before he is finally at the end of the novel able to reclaim his kingdom and his wife. The novel's principal critics, and there have been very few of them over the last 200 years, have read the book as a kind of allegorical representation of various historical personages, locations, and events, but also strikingly unable to identify who these characters are, right? So the, there's a desire, which I think is very often the case when you encounter an allegory to say, A is B, right? That you identify a fictional personage with a historical, uh, 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 fictional character with a historical personage. So for example, a one 19th century scholar identified uh, the, 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 the hero as the son of the Georgian king, right? Uh, but at the same time, she attributed many of his actions to the Russian administration. So you have this kind of schizophrenic uh, text in which 
uh, the misrule of Russia of the Russian colonial administration is attributed to a Georgian monarch, right? Um, so it's a curious conflation, if you like, of the colonizer and the colonized. Uh, another critic from the Soviet period um, was more interested in actually fixing the particular site of the novel and said it's actually taking place in a particular village in North Ossetia called Shmi, right? Uh, but at the same time, he was surprised by in fact the fact that none of the, the standard uh, uh, visual uh, markers of Chmi were immediately palpable in this particular novel, right? Now, a novel that clearly references the Dalai Lama of Tibet is hardly likely to be uh, a proto-realist in any particular way. So we need to think about other ways of reading this text and make it come alive again for us, uh, as particularly at this moment where I think we're also thinking about the legacy of these complex hybrid figures, right? These Russophone Ukrainians, and, and, and how to think about these figures as functioning within a larger imperial uh, context. So I want to suggest that one way to think about this novel is not simply as an allegory in the in the in the in the more mechanical sense, but rather uh, as a kind of allegorical and also satirical restaging of the endless negotiations of sovereignty enacted by Caucasian elites as a means of mitigating local rivalries as well as responding to imperial encroachment. In other words, it's a kind of pseudo ethnography, right, of the relations between the different warring tribes and petty kingdoms or principalities of the North Caucasus on the eve of Russian rule. And to give you one example of how to think about this, I wanted to quote a uh, particularly telling um, uh, observation by Semyon Branyevsky, who in his Navyeshe Zistia Kafkazi, one of the earliest Russian encyclopedic sources on the Caucasus, which was widely consulted by uh, the Russian uh, imperial, uh, the colonial bureaucracy, as well as travelers to the region, has the following thing to say. It is harder still to depict in broad strokes the chaotic web of prospects, alliances, and claims which constitute the politics of the mountain peoples. But a politics they do have, unich yes politica, right? So in other words, what, what I think Brzezinski is trying to do is think about what constitutes the political for a ostensibly in enlightenment terms, a pre-political right? community, right? A community that has yet to constitute itself as a state in the normative modern European understanding of the term, right? So unich yes politica, of which regrettably we have little understanding, right? They possess a popular sense of legality sustained by unwritten laws and customs, narodne prava, sabudayama and nepisanimi zakonimi ili abuchimi, no less known to them are other means by which to solicit aid, gain time, mollify a strong enemy, or generate mutual reconciliation, alliances, treaties, diplomatic missions, gifts, mediations, guarantees and pledges. So uh, I, I want here acknowledge, of course, the work of, of Bruce, Bruce Grant, who in The Captive and the Gift, uh, Cultural Histories of Sovereignty in Russia and the Caucasus, has underlined the importance of gift giving and sacrificial exchange, no less than violent conquest to Russia's domination of the Caucasus, as well as the local responses to Russian hegemony. And what I want to suggest in, in a sense is that this particular novel, in a sense, is a kind of almost allegorical representation of, of Bruce's own work on, 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 uh, on you know, the anthropological or ethnographic uh, history of Russia's encounter with the Caucasus. In other words, what essentially this novel is doing is, in a sense, uh, serving as a kind of mirror to, pr a mirror to princes, in which the prince is being educated into the ways and means of symbolic exchange. Right? The, the means uh, of symbolic exchange is a kind of supplement as well as a correlative to the exercise of raw power. In other words, what we might say is that the, this is a book that is trying to look at customary law, right? as well as the enlightenment, and put it alongside this kind of enlightenment project that we already saw with Dijavin of self-sovereignty, of self-constraint, right? uh, as a way of, of moderating and, uh, and, and, and supplementing uh, sovereignty understood in, in terms of pure power. Um, so that's essentially the, the idea that I wanted to share with you from this novel. And what essentially happens is that the novel um, moves through its different chapters as a kind of um, an acting of what Richard Wolfman would have called uh, scenarios of power, right? So it goes from chapter to chapter in which uh, Scenarios of power move from what we might call an initially purely voluntaristic understanding of sovereignty as a kind of self-assertion of authority towards um, um, 
uh, towards more nuanced or modified understandings of power in which um, force is understood as coexisting alongside modes of symbolic exchange and the internalization of the law. Now, what's interesting here is the way in which that law is understood not simply in enlightenment terms as universal reason, right, but also in terms of customary law, right? And so it's this idea of the coexistence of the two that's also going to be an important aspect of this book in which Tolstoy later on when he writes Haji Barat is going to be exploring in ways that I don't have, of course, time to discuss today. So I'm going to uh, very briefly talk about the, my last text in even shorter terms and then move to uh, some conclusions. Uh, so the, the third text that I, I wanted to share with you is called uh, Life and Adventures of Harutyun Araratyan. Um, it was published, as I mentioned, in a Russian translation authored by Araratyan himself. And interestingly, the putative Armenian original has been lost. Right? Uh, it purports to, uh, um, and this is in many ways a kind of a uh, trickster text by a trickster author. Right? Um, and more of which I'll, I'll, I'll share with you in a minute, right? And it purports to tell the story of the author's life from his birth in 1774 to his arrival in St. Petersburg in 1797. And the book's two volumes elicited considerable interest on its publication. Um, and its immediate success was, of course, due to the fact that this is, it came out precisely at the time in which Russia was signing its treaty with Persia, the Treaty of Gulistan, right, which elicited an intense amount of interest in ruling circles in Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, towards this newly uh, uh, expanding uh, southern periphery. Um, so it's, it's, as you can see from the title, uh, or its subtitle, it promises to relate the life of a native of the village of Varashapat near Mount Ararat, and the adventures that befell him from his childhood to maturity, his migration from his homeland to Georgia, and thence to Russia, then to Persia, and then finally back to Russia by the Caspian Sea, and the description of many a curious object located in his land, as well as other parts of Persia. Right? So what makes this text uh, so interesting and so unusual? Uh, I want to just in the sense is that it, it becomes a kind of complex mirror to the Armenian story, right? Um, and what's interesting is that this is a moment, of course, where Armenia has essentially been reduced to a, um, a cluster of Ottoman provinces, as well as vassal states subservient to Iran, um, as well as extraterritorial Armenian communities that constituted one of the most successful merchant diasporas in uh, Eurasia. Um, so what's interesting about this particular memoir is that on the one hand, it's consistent, it consistently displays an awareness of um, Armenian ethno-linguistic and religious identity, right? Uh, but also the kind of cosmopolitan savoir-faire that an Armenian would require in order to survive in a multi-ethnic world dominated by foreign overlords, right? At the same time, and this is also an interesting aspect of the book, is that it's a, it's a book that's also dominated by an acute sense of class of social class, right? Aradatian comes from the poorest um, artisanal right, uh, communities of uh, essentially a dispossessed people. And so class alongside ethnicity are the two categories, social categories that, uh, that in a sense dictate Aradatian's sense of adventure as he propels himself forward from um, misadventure to misadventure. Uh, to give you two examples of the um, not even curiosity, I would say almost kind of um, um, puzzlement that Ararathian um, elicited. Let me give you two quick quotes from his contemporaries. Mura, uh, the, the, the general Muravyov um, says the following, Ararathian is a poor Armenian born into a lowly vocation in the vicinity of the monastery. In his youth, he conceived a passion for travel and took to wandering the world devoid of any means. He traits about Europe and Asia for an extended period of time. Uh, he learns languages. He writes a short book. That's the one that I'm about to share with you. He owns no property, is as poor as he ever was, and with the onset of old age has resettled in his homeland in the cell of a monk, right? So this is not a rags to rich story, uh, riches story, right? This is rather a story in a sense about a man who, like many a picaresque hero, gets into a pickle, right? And then manages to get out of it. Uh, and the second quote I wanted to very quickly share is by um, someone called Silvestre Chedrin, the, the great painter who bumps into uh, 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 Araratian in, no less, in, in, in Naples, Italy, no less. And he says, I couldn't make a head or tail out of this Asiatic. Why did he travel about? Is he clever or is he foolish? Rich or poor? He does not wish to see anything, and yet he knows everything. To me, he is an enigma, right? So I want to bring this text, this very marginal text, written by this sort of shadow Armenian, right, who's um, 
the, the linguistic nature, which is not even entirely fully established, right, into a dialogue with these highly canonical texts, such as the Rajavid, to see where we can go with this as I move towards my conclusion, right? Uh, so I want to suggest that what makes this text interesting is this, on the one hand, that it looks back to what we might call archaic modes of, of uh, fictional self-narration, travel writing, fiction, uh, picaresque fiction, which figures, for example, like uh, critics like Mikhail Bakhtin have traced back to uh, the proto-novelistic genres of Hellenistic antiquity, the adventure novel, right? But what also makes this, I think, text also singularly modern is the way it fuses the personal and the historical. So that in some sense, the novel can also be read as a kind of allegory, and a particularly modern allegory of which more in just a moment. Um, and it's by reading it this way, I want to suggest that we can get out of the, the trap into which many critics of this novel have fallen, which read the novel, uh, the text simply as, as you put it, a forgery. So for example, um, Nikolai Mar, the, the famous Soviet linguist, or the notorious Soviet linguist, as well as many other Armenian critics, have basically accused Araratyan of forging this text, right? Uh, and, and, and have claimed that it was essentially serving to, to fog off a, a fictional narrative as a historical document, right? Uh, and it's certainly true that this is a text that was for a long time read in the 19th century as a source of information about the 1790s. In other words, the Zubov campaign about which Dirjavin also wrote, right? But what I want to suggest in fact is that we might also want to read this text, not so much in historical terms, but in allegorical and fictional terms, right? Um, the novel is, is an overtly self-fictionalizing and self-fashioning text. And I want to suggest that it also can be read in this sense as an Armenian national allegory, one that explores the deterritorialized condition of the Armenian people, through the vicissitudes of one protagonist. In other words, now I'm moving towards a sort of a contemplation of what sovereignty might mean for a deterritorialized people rather than one that is uh, that sees sovereignty precisely in terms of national boundaries. Um, so essentially, uh, I mean, it, it's a long text and I don't want to get into the, the weeds with you, uh, but what's interesting about it, and then maybe I could just share one quote before I move to, the, to my conclusion, uh, is this, there's a particular moment in the text where um, Aratyan bumps into the army of none other than Count Valerian Zubov, about which Dirjavid was writing in St. Petersburg, right? So if we juxtapose these two texts, what we get essentially are two competing views of that same campaign and that same historical moment and that same geographical site, right? Which is somewhere between Dagestan and modern day Azerbaijan in 1795, right? Uh, uh, and, but the two cases are entirely different because Dirjavin is writing from St. Petersburg, right? At the very pinnacle of the Russian state, while Aratyan is this kind of bedraggled, right? Shoeless Armenian who basically wanders into the, to the, to the mili Russian military encampment, right? And, and here's what he has to say about that moment. A wealthy Armenian, a native son of Sirdavi, came to the Russian commander-in-chief at the rest camp by Gurt Bulak, as an emissary from the Georgian King Erekle. The object of his diplomatic mission was, as I heard, that King Erekle, intending to march on Ganje against the Persians and avenge the destruction of his nation and the death of his subjects, sought the help of Khan Zubov. So we have here this extraordinary moment where the Georgians are in a negotiation uh, uh, with the Russians, right? But it's this deterritorialized indigent Armenian who's observing these negotiations as he wanders into the camp, right? On hearing of the arrival of this emissary, I was curious to see him and no more than four days later met him as he was departing. Frankly, I, don't, I suspect that much of this didn't happen, right? This is a kind of complex fictional restaging of the possibility of the self-empowerment of this kind of marginal figure who claims retroactively to be a witness to history. I did not know him at all, having never come across him when I had lived in Signagi, but on catching sight of me, he immediately walked up to me beaming and said, ah, oh, my friend, are you here? Then he inquired as to how I had fallen in with the Russian army and how I had come to be in the terrible poverty in which he found me, right? Now, I want to suggest that rather than seeing this as, as, a, as I said, a historical document, we need to think about this as a kind of picaresque dramatization of how a marginal character can, as I said, inscribe himself into history. And here we might want to, uh, this might be the last point I'll make before I turn to my conclusions. Uh, 
we might want to compare this to the, there is one other Armenian autobiography that had been written around the same time, or in fact, just before uh, Araratyan. So this is Araratyan's text is the second autobiography written in modern Armenian, right? Or modern Armenian in quotes, since we don't have the original text. The other one is by this very interesting figure called Joseph Emin, who is a, an Armenian, Anglophone Armenian living in uh, uh, Calcutta, India, right? Part of this vast trading diaspora. And he writes a, a text called The Life and Adventures of Joseph Emin, which is published in, in London in 1792, right? And it's fascinating to compare these two texts, right? One written in London for an Anglophone readership, another published in St. Petersburg some decades later for a Russophone readership. Uh, but what's interesting is that while Emin's text is a predictably enlightenment text, it's one that's seeking to essentially gain the support of the, his British overlords, right? To secure something like a, an Armenian nation state understood in, as a kind of self-governing enlightenment polity, right? What's interesting about Aratyan, and this is the point I want to leave us with as I move to the conclusion, is that it's a text that actually doesn't insist on Armenian uh, territorial autonomy, right? Rather it's a text that wants to in a sense contemplate the possibility of something like sovereignty in a radically deterritorialized geography and history, right? And what would that mean? So let me now move to my conclusions. So to conclude, what then do these three texts of what might be called the late Russian enlightenment uh, have to teach us? All three texts, it must be said, are Russocentric. Yet the Russocentrism which unites these texts also allows us to think or rethink the hegemonic narratives of imperial domination and national liberation, which have dominated histories of the modern. It is striking to note that each of these texts holds the Russian state in a profoundly ambivalent embrace. Dzerzhavin, cabinet secretary to Catherine the Great, could not have been closer to the heart of Russian imperial power. Yet his commemoration of Count Zubov's campaign of 1797 has little to do with raison d'etat. Philosophically, his work expounds a stoic doctrine of inner equilibrium in confronting the shifting contours of the absolutist state. Artistically, Dzerzhavin establishes a new idiom of alpine landscape as an allegorical mirror to the self one destined to resonate in complex ways over two centuries of Russian literature. Both these dimensions are in the service of aesthetic and ethical freedoms that would continue to inform the Russian literary tradition. Like Dzerzhavin, Naryezhny too adhered to a pre-romantic literary sensibility which subordinated the topographical and ethnographic realities of the Caucasus to a didactic allegorical purpose. Like Dzerzhavin, Naryezhny narrates a hero's journey imagined in Baroque terms as a precipitous series of ups and downs, the wheel of fortune that propels him to come from home uh, uh, before uh, uh, restoring, uh, restoring him to an enriched sense of homeland and selfhood. Both these heroes, Count Zubov and Prince Kaituk, must learn to reconcile the principle of political authority with the subtler task of self-mastery, since true sovereignty can only arise from the reciprocal correction of self and the wider polity. The merit of both Dzerzhavin and Naryezhny was to note the evident gap between the Enlightenment and Russian colonial governance. The solution was to propose disciplinary power as a supplement to political sovereignty in the service of edifying and modifying the self. This innovation, while remaining squarely within the ideological limits of Enlightenment discourse, and I'm not suggesting that these are radical texts, I'm, I will be looking in my book at much more politically radical and transformative texts than the ones I've shared with you today, right? But nonetheless, I'm interested in them for the, for the way in which they are still capable of critiquing or offering something like a critique of empire. If Dzerzhavin proved incapable of projecting beyond the realm of noble servitors to which he belonged, then it was Naryezhny, the Ukrainian's unusual achievement to identify with the fate of an indigenous ruler, however fictitious, who is soon to be absorbed into the Russian state. The memoirs of the Armenian Araratyan is striking in its subaltern perspective. As befits the picaresque travelogue with a folk protagonist, his memoirs embrace the, the inherent value of, of errancy, of perennial displacement, seeing all stasis as only temporary. 
Either that Jan's spatial orientation has deep literary roots in the adventure novel of the Eastern Mediterranean. Its modernity lies in relating the condition of errancy itself to self-emancipation, personal, and by symbolic extension, the national, but without the finality of territorial boundaries. So to conclude, I want to suggest that the literariness of these texts allows us to glimpse the events of a long gone era for more than their geopolitical import. And here, one of my perennial interests is always how to think about the literary and the political without subsuming the literary into the political, but showing how the literary itself can symbolically stage alternative forms of the political. They point, in other words, to subjective modalities, multiple loyalties, and disciplines of the self that seek to reimagine the force of empire as modes of resilience and survival. From dif different aesthetic, geographical, and scalar perspectives then, all three texts point beyond the events of the turn of the 18th century to the double-edged nature of modern empires, uh, agents of repressive order to be sure, but also vehicles of a modernity whose emancipatory potential was essential to envisioning other possible futures, whether as free nation states or, and I say this in conclusion for the sake of all the people trapped today by disputes over land and territory from the Caucasus to Ukraine in forms that we have yet to imagine. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Harsha, for inviting me from, from afar to comment on your uh, rich and thought-provoking piece, and specifically to say a few words about the afterlife of the problematics of sovereignty in the literary tradition of the 19th century. So I will begin by trying to recapitulate the complex argument very briefly, and then highlight an important feature within it, which I think is especially relevant to the later literary tradition, and then to turn briefly to a passage from a 19th century Russian novel in order to see how that feature can reappear in a curiously distorted way. Harsha's three case studies zero in on the ways the South Caucasus functions as the site for complex literary engagements with the problematics of sovereign power. Sovereign power is here understood by terms as well as simultaneously as imperial, modernizing, disciplinary, and enlightened. Each case study is organized around a distinct dialectic between the faithful vicissitudes of absolutist succession and the stoic fortitude of inner sovereignty in Dzerzhavin's ode, between raw imperial power and customary practices of symbolic reciprocity in Naryezhny's novel, and between the territorializing centripetal forces of the imperial capital and the picaresque encounters on the periphery in Araratyan's memoir. In all three cases, we can see quite clearly that the inter-imperial predicament of the Caucasus poses a challenge to visions of enlightened modernizing absolutism, and thus provokes attempts at symbolic compensation in which figures of political sovereignty are reaffirmed and questioned at once. It is the ambivalent functionary poet Dzerzhavin, the author closest to the three, uh, of the three to the throne, who seems to me to pose the most direct and at least in literary historical terms, the most consequential challenge to the poetics and politics of absolutism. The challenge in Harsha's account, as I understand it, is essentially twofold, ethical and aesthetic. In ethical terms, we are dealing with an assertion of the absolute non-transitory values of personal virtue, dobradite, and fortitude, mužestva. The first is exemplified in such characteristics as solicitude for the unfortunate, respect for one's elders, lack of arrogance and affectation, and these in turn seem to rest on the still more fundamental characteristic of fortitude, which designates equanimity in misfortune, or more broadly, the self-standing sovereign subject indifferent to external manifestations of worldly power. Dzerzhavin stages the emergence of what Harsha calls, quote, the internal sovereignty of the self, unquote, in the following two stanzas, dramatized, dramatizing the uh, turn of the wheel of fortune, the loss of the monarch's favor. And I apologize, I will try to share this uh, in a moment, um, it seems worthwhile just because, um, yeah, to get a little piece of uh, this, another piece of this fantastic uh, poem. Um, 
и грудне счастье люту, и как оно к тебе хребет свой с грозным смехом повернуло, ты видишь. Видишь, как мечты сияние в грудь тебя заснуло, прошло. Остался только ты. Остался ты, и та прекрасна душа почтенно будет век, с которой ты внимал несчастно и был вельможе человек. Um, what I would like to comment on here is the striking use of andeplosis between the two stanzas, transitioning from the downcast Astalsa Tolka Ti to the triumphant Astalsa Ti. The poet in, these, uh, in this gap between the two stanzas marks the emergence of ethical sovereignty at the moment when political charisma fades and the grandee is stripped down to a human being. As a corollary of such stripping down, Cultural production too begins to acquire ostensibly universalist characteristics with the emergence of the notion of, aesthetic, of the aesthetic as such. The aesthetic, the aesthetic fleshes up in Harsha's analysis of Dirjavin's text with a momentary separation of landscape description from political allegorical implications. With landscape as such, we are in the, in the domain of politically neutral, quote unquote, intrinsically enriching contemplation associated with aesthetic autonomy and more broadly with the autonomy of cultural production. The sublime, the beautiful, the picturesque emerge here, if only momentarily, as categories of the autonomous aesthetic in opposition to the kind of art that explicitly serves the symbolic purposes of the monarch or the patron. The ethical and aesthetic challenges to political sovereignty converge on the figure of the autonomous sovereign subject. In Dejavin's Ode to Zubov, sovereignty is, as it were, symbolically transferred from the figure of political authority to the model individual, the poet with the self-governing, ethical, equilibrated self. But as Harsha suggests in his discussion of Dejavin's biographical predicament, as well as of the Ode itself, the situation here is more complicated. For the opposition between absolutist power and ethical autonomy must be grasped also as an identity between them. It was after all Catherine herself who instructed her subject to become cultivated human beings, to govern themselves and to appreciate beauty. Indeed, ethical inner autonomy can be understood as a correlate of absolute power, which strove both to turn its subjects into trustworthy servitors and simultaneously to depoliticize them. The later history of Russian absolutism, uh, I'm sorry, of Russian liberalism, uh, a significant slip, uh, shows quite clearly the extent to which ethical sovereignty and political absolutism could appear as mutually reinforcing rather than contradictory. From the point of view of that tradition, nothing was more intuitive than the idea of reading Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan as a path-breaking manifesto of contractarian liberalism. The sovereign was there to ensure the control of the individual over his private domain, to ensure that the individual is not encroached upon by other individuals. As for aesthetic sovereignty, Russian censorship practices show that nothing was more desirable to the state than aesthetically autonomous art that would focus on depicting beautiful landscapes and stay out of politics. So the dialectic of opposition and mutual implication between political and inner sovereignty is laid bare repeatedly throughout the 19th century literary tradition. Now I'm switching to sort of the, the subject matter that I was assigned, um, um, especially striking is the case of realist fiction, which in the West tended to privilege precisely the figure of the self-governing individual whose aspirations do not extend beyond moral decency, personal cultivation, and domestic happiness. The individual becomes, in the Russian instantiation, merely an individual, altogether cut off from the sources of meaning which continue to converge on political sovereignty. What is articulated here, curiously, I think, is a critique precisely of the vision Dejavin puts forward, a critique that casts the sovereign individual himself as the outcome of political oppression and exclusion. As a mere individual, an honnête homme in a nobleman's, in a noble woman's salon, Turgenev's Rudin, cuts a pitiful figure, only as a political exile and then a fighter on the barricades does he acquire seriousness and stature. Here, Dejavin's affirmative astalsa ti turns into the figure so astutely analyzed by Nikolai Chuknashevsky as Ruski Chilevek na Rendevu, and still better known as the Vishni Chilevek, the superfluous man. 
This is the pitiful figure of a man enclosed within the narrow horizon of private interests and completely unfit for political confrontation. In this connection, I would uh, like to take a look briefly at the rather inconspicuous and little commented upon episode from Alexander Herzen's 1846 novel, Kto an episode that I think can be read as a kind of conjunctural 18th century genealogy of the figure of the 19th century superfluous man. And my friends in the audience, I hope will forgive me because although I say it is little commented upon, I, I have talked about this episode to no end. So, so uh, apologies to you who have heard uh, me talk about this. Uh, we recall that Vladimir Beltov traditionally taken uh, as the first major instance of the type of the superfluous man received his ill-fitting education from the citizen of the Republic of Geneva, Monsieur Joseph. Less frequently noted is the fact that Monsieur Joseph is recommended to Beltov's mother by his uncle, a cynical old free thinker thoroughly withdrawn from contemporary life. The episode I want to look at is tacitly presented as the explanation for what made Beltov's uncle, and by extension Beltov himself, the hopeless man they become. The point of origin is located somewhere in the 1770s, soon after the uncle's arrival to St. Petersburg as a brilliant young lieutenant of the guards. One day, Beltov, this older Beltov, the uncle Beltov, gets involved, the older Beltov as a younger man, <laughs> gets involved in a sled race on Nevsky Prospect, with, quote, a tall, stately man wrapped in his bearskin coat. When the lieutenant's sled wins the race, the mysterious stranger roars in a, quote, lion-like voice and strikes the, other, the other's coachman, which is to say Beltov's coachman, and glancingly Beltov himself with a whip. The two get into a combative exchange, and the end of which the massive gentleman contemptuously shows the lieutenant his fist as large as an elephant's foot, and drives away. The lieutenant follows his rival in the hopes of discovering where he lives and challenging him to a duel. But the discovery of the man's dwelling place dissuades him. And Herzen's narrator is telling all of this in sort of little hints and winks. And, and uh, he doesn't tell you why it dissuades him, but uh, the reader, the astute reader, um, understands. Uh, instead, uh, once once uh, Beltov realizes that he's not going to be able to enter the, uh, this uh, man's dwelling place, uh, Beltov decides to write the man a letter and begins quite well, we are told, but before he has a chance to finish it, he is placed under arrest and transferred to a distant fortress. From there, he returns only years later, rather deranged. So the outsized proportions of the mystery man, the lionine voice, the notorious bearskin, the free wielding of the whip, the inaccessibility, and even as it were, unmentionability of his dwelling place, all placed in the 70s, 70s, point to the figure of Catherine's most illustrious and broadly mythologized favorite, Grigory Patomkin. What appears to be a competitive encounter between two members of the nobility with its rules of engagement and rituals of combat turns out to be an asymmetrical confrontation between an individual and an absolute power of the state. Characteristically, this power manifests itself precisely at the moment when it can no longer be seen. It appears as sovereign precisely insofar as it is excluded from direct competition and confrontation. It vanishes as something, so as a kind of depolitization, oddly enough. It vanishes as something one might resist and reappears as that to which one must submit dissolves into a sheer impersonal force, the order of things, which like a blow of fate or a turn of the wheel of fortune can forever alter the life of the subject confronting it. Something like the wheel of fortune appears explicitly as an image in Herzen's novel in a very curious uh, episode where uh, we have a description of the way Bent of Think feels uh, uh, while working for Russian state bureaucracy, and he says that it is as if, as if it were the windmill throwing people here and there, um, a kind of grand, uh, kind of gigantic wheel that um, uh, had control over the, uh, the, the subjects, uh, uh, fates, destinies. Um, uh, 
So the wheel, the wheel of fortune or something like it appears explicitly as an image and indeed its logic organizes much of the narrative. The protagonist's trajectories repeatedly undergo the warping effects of this or that exercise of despotic power, effects that moreover reverberate through generations. Eventually, all of them seek, seek out scenarios of withdrawal and one might argue a kind, kinds of scenarios of ethical withdrawal uh, of the sort that um, uh, Dijravin hints at. But of course, by 1840s, many more such scenarios are available. One withdraws into cynical free thinking, melancholy sentimentalism, as in the case of Kutsefersky, Sandy and pastoralism, as in the case of Luba, Byronically inflected disenchantment, uh, as in the case of Deltov, and so on. But the space of withdrawal, the space of private life, is privatively defined, not as the space of independence, <clears throat> though it is at times desired as such, but as the space of exile from meaningful existence, the space where one inevitably loses orientation, goes mad, languishes, and dies. Nothing of significance is decided in that space. Everything befalls one, as it were, from the outside. In short, I would like to suggest that Herzen's early realist novel hints at the difficulty with which Dijavin's script of individual sovereignty, of individual sovereignty, was assimilated by the later tradition, and the hold that the figure of political sovereignty con continued to have over cultural producers well into the 19th century and beyond. Okay, so with great appreciation to our audience over there, I also don't get to see Harsh very often, he's over here, so I'll probably stare at Anne Lounsbury in the middle and uh, hope that this somehow works. So I uh, am grateful to Idia for being much more elegant than me, but I also was trying to be a bit canny in asking Idia to go first because I, from my own um, Invasions, we all like to flatter ourselves that we can take part in an interdisciplinary world, but I think that no field is more so than literary literature has been hijacked by other fields in the service of political commentary, historical commentary, and topological speculation, that kind of thing. And at the end, we're still talking about the ornamentation of not, not, not or the literary traditions in ADL's books that so well, and I'm grateful for that. I, what do I want to say about this paper? If um, I won't go on too long, if people um, remember anything that I say, if anything is useful to you, it is going to be the word property and maybe also the word geopoetics in the title of this book. Mm -hmm. uh, more so maybe than landscape and a few other things, but I, um, but it's all up to you. Mm -hmm. As the author, you poor guy who have to finish this book. <laughs> If the paper is assigned, then we're in pretty good stead. This is really well organized. It's a wonderful paper. It's convincing. It's clear. It's got a few incredibly thoughtful pivots at the beginning that I'd like to identify. It works. So you don't need me here, right? Um, it, I, I think one of the things that I just want to say is in a very general sense that I like the most uh, is that if I were going to rein in even some minor things here, I, I love to pivot kind of midway through whichever page it was on of, that we're looking at a not fully realized genre somehow, right? Mm -hmm. The pre-romantic tradition, and then later you described it as a, you know, you described it in one way as a late Russian mm -hmm. enlightenment tradition, and another time you said it was a transition from mm -hmm. Baroque poetics. Mm -hmm. I understand all the reasons that you have to do that or want to do that, but I really would love to see you also hold to the time and space that these texts were addressing. And, and not even necessarily indulge in the not fully realized, but embrace the fact that these have been elusive texts and to turn this kind of handicap into a theme mm -hmm. and ask why, what, what is it that's kind of a bullion about these texts that has refused easier labels of Baroque or Enlightenment or Romanticism mm -hmm. rather than surrendering them to one or the other as partial or not fully realized, right? I think you're onto something stronger here to which I think you're already beginning to take credit. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really looking forward to the book. So to be provocative here, my most provocative sounding comment, which will sound you know, hopefully not mean, but I'm Canadian, so the meanness <laughs> sounds about right. I don't think your conclusion, fine, right? It's the only part I read this paper and I was like, this is great, this is great, this is great, this is great. And I got to the conclusion and I was like, 
Harsh is a wonderful, smart guy. If you need these conclusions to finish the book, that's fine, right? But I want to encourage you to think about other conclusions. And the only reason I'm saying this is because no one's going to disagree with your conclusions, right? About the dis about the ambivalence about empire or about resilience or this or that. But uh, you know, so many people have remarked on it in different ways. Not here, right? So it's valuable. There's nothing nothing wrong with this. It's elegant. It's good. But I think you're doing much more than that to me. Mm -hmm. What I got excited about in these papers were not what that last slide was, right? So there's nothing wrong with that last slide, right? Because you're absolutely right that all three of the texts speak to this. So how do I get there? And I uh, let me warm up to property. Early on on page two, you say you want to get at the political in the end, the logical articulations of sovereignty. You're Hands down, the political is just fine. And the end, the political is pretty good too, but I want to press the latter in regions that will not surprise you. The, one of the best pivots of this paper is that you tell us early on that in order to address the political, we have this distribution of thinking between fi 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 figure and ground, right? And though you don't mention it, the mm -hmm. simple example here would be Schmidt in reminding us that we don't really even necessarily need a sovereign or a leader. Mm -hmm. You know, the sovereign is the person or the situation that decides on the exception. Mm -hmm. That's the ground that announces the political. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, so you divide this up really nicely. And the wonderful pivot is that then you draw us into this ground of sy sy symbolization. I think that's smart. I think that's simple. I wish I'd thought of it years ago. I wish I'd read these texts years ago. So I, I loved all of this. The paper's great. So you start us off, having done that pivot, for which I think you really should be taking credit for well here. <clears throat> you walk us through then what I want to call the, um, the anthropological notions here, which is not so much, which you've done a perfectly good job with. I just want to press them further. We want to remember here that the anthropological is not a shorthand for a cabinet of curiosity. Mm -hmm. You didn't say that. I'm volunteering that. It's not so that we're at the salad bar of peoples and we say, okay, this is the Russian one, this is the Asian mm -hmm. one, this is the Kumuik or something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it's that we want to think about the constitution of the real, the normal, the appropriate in different settings, right? We want to think about how sovereignty came to be thought of as an idea or a normalcy across time and space in different ways. Now you start us off with a few examples. You talk about this um, asymmetrical exchange, lots of people have taken that up and you've done a great job with this. Zuboff is our great example here. You eventually culminate in your reading of Zuboff, Idiot does a great job of bringing this out. Of this uh, sovereignty as a kind of a technique of self-mastery, this, this ethical dimension, all of that works, all of that is great. But it's also fairly well trodden territory, right? Now you need to trod it too. But where I got kind of excited here is uh, so you need to do all the above. I think you should, it obviously needs to stay. However, I got kind of excited here with the notion of landscape and the geopoetics. Why? Because so much of sovereignty, most of most people tend to assume hinges around not just self-governance, but governance over territory, right? And I'd like to suggest from, not just in the Caucasus, but from quite a number of other studies from around the world across time and space, that property is frequently not really involved, right? Where people don't have the same kind of property regimes as we might today, and are more interested in their interpersonal relations and who's dominating each other, mm -hmm. not necessarily who's owning the physical land, right? Mm -hmm. Which is one of the things that, comes up not necessarily in this place in the Jordan Center, but in my own department of anthropology and my discipline as a whole. Finally, you know, in the uh, it, it was uh, quite moving to me that the uh, Association of Indigenous Anthropologists about a year ago finally asked for a pause on land acknowledgments because, hmm. among other things, they pointed out that uh, this is a pretty broad transhistorical category and not everyone has the same property regimes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if anything, if we wanted to really appreciate the some sense of social di di difference here, that people were so piously and earnestly trying to perform in for, for excellent reasons, the um, if we really want to recognize the challenge of radical difference, we might start with the possibility that indigenous peoples were laudable for the very reason that they weren't obsessed with taking each other's land in the same way. Mm -hmm. And my very limited experience in trying to think about this in the Caucasus leads to something along these lines. So what I want to get with in just a few more minutes mm -hmm. 
that if we really want to think of geopolitics, which is such a primary word in your book title, mm -hmm. it's the presence or absence of idioms of property that I think is so interesting, right? And you bring this up in your text. Um, you end on an incredibly elegant line here, and then I'm going to backfill after that. You know, you end on forms we have yet to imagine, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind and that's elegant, and, and it certainly applies to the world that we live in right now because we're screwed in so many ways. And we, mm -hmm. I don't want to slow down any act of the imagination, but I do want to propose that we don't necessarily have to imagine these new forms no. or new forms because you've already given us some, and I want you to mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to start taking credit for some of those, right? Let's back up from the, you very thoughtfully throw in a second text here that's not in the paper, is it Enin, Joseph Enin, uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so, so we've already had a notion here where you yourself suggest that we could be thinking not so much that the, you know, we could think of the historical and global tragedies of Armenians and the genocide and so forth as always somehow being attached to deterritorialization, and I don't want to diminish any of that, but nonetheless, I'm fascinated by the possibility of reading the um, Ararachan mm -hmm. uh, text a bit differently than your, or in the direction that you do take it with the second one, which is where, pro where the deterritorialization itself doesn't matter as much as it normally does, mm -hmm. right? That's the absence of property, when Mordorkio says, this fellow owns no property, I don't know what to do with him, mm -hmm. that's the invitation to think of an idiom, mm -hmm. a belonging of sovereignty, of mutual domination that is, or mutual scrapping over domination that I think is a story that is not yet really being told here mm -hmm. yet, right? Mm -hmm. Let's keep going backwards. In um, the Nariyashni's novel, you signal here, and this is, you know, again, you did work telegraphically here in a wonderful way, so this is for later, but in Nariyashni's novel, you signal that he's interested in a certain kind of experimentation with a uh, dot, right? Mm -hmm. But we want to think about, well, what are the signs of that? One of the ones that you give us, Don, this comes up at one point in the thing, <laughs> is that in the novel, the prince's authority founders on his inability to translate sovereignty into an expanding network of domination. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that already gets my ears up because, you know, in the Caucasus, as if we want to think of another bridge, right? Pierre Clostro's work in Society Against the State, there's many societies where the, the, the possibility of an expanding network of domination was always impossible. Right? The question was, how are you dominating other people in a given moment and time for personal reputation, regardless of what this, of whether it was a network or whether it was a military victory and so on and so forth. That's what was, at least in my own very different world, mm -hmm. dominant, you know, driving my own interest in, in intermarriage, in histories of trade in the caucuses, in uh, different systems of kinship, of slavery, of, ca of, of captivity, of transformation, of you know the little ethnological and historical knowledge that we have about these things, to think about how people could somehow dominate, but not necessarily um, decimate, right? So, but that's mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, which of that? It seems to me that mm -hmm. you're getting it. Then, definite conversations around sovereignty that might, you know. You're reflecting on a Russian Georgian encounter, and I know this is not part of the paper, not mm -hmm. part of the book, but whether it's in Russian or Georgian or not, even reminding us about Georgian reflections from this same period, because mm -hmm. they were very much right writing and still the shoe waiting to drop in a mm -hmm. longer version. Mm -hmm. But I loved the Bushton Spiegel, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, these uh, main mirrors for princes, because those are the recipe books for this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I always want to give a, a shout out to Slavs and Potters, of course, the wonderful, <laughs> going back to the world of Berlin, where he is. Um, you know, we have a Persianist among it, Sam is still on the screen, and uh, perhaps others, who can tell us, right, about um, the possibility of, since this was indeed part of these vassal states of, around this time, still under the sway of some mm -hmm. of the principalities of northern Iran, and so on and so forth. That's where I think, even if we're always going to be on slippery ground, you are raising incredibly important questions about the geopolitics, which is absolutely in the service of a certain kind of sovereignty. And mm -hmm. that's why I want to read this book. Mm 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to go sit over somewhere else. Okay. So I can look at the chat. Okay. And then people can look at you because that's what they came. <laughs> okay. For. All right. So uh, thank you so much. So this is kind of what I was hoping for. So I'm terribly grateful. This is actually the first sort of sustained conversation I've had around these things. I'm delighted to see Kirill Aspavat there as well in the, in the, in the audience. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually, um, rather than talk for a long time, I'm just going to address two points. I think one by Ilya and one by, uh, one by Bruce. And then maybe we can, in the little time we have left, open it up to some further questions. I don't know when we're meant to end. Two? Uh, sorry, uh, what time is it? Three? Okay. Um, okay, so um, I think Ilya touched on, I think, a really important and fundamental kind of ambiguity in my project, which is also one I think that Kirill Aspavat touches on very you know, eloquently in his own book on literature in the state, which is, to what extent is this ethical turn? that I foregrounded in the Dirjavin, right? Is it a moment, and the kind of possibility of some notion of personal autonomy that it affords, to what extent is it, is it a freedom or an illusion of freedom? To what extent is it antithetical or counterposed to the state? Or to what extent is it an effect of the state, right? Uh, and it's certainly true, and Kirill talks about this much more in much greater detail, and I will also touch on this in my book, that these, you know, these kind of ethical spiritual discourses, you know, emerge in on Russian soil in the mid 18th century, right, around the, the you know, the, the, the reign of Anne and Elizabeth, and then become in, and intensify over the course of the reign of Catherine, right, but they're largely promoted and uh, sponsored by the state, right, uh, and so they become on the one hand, a kind of a, a sp state sponsored enlightenment, if you will, right, but also embraced by the enlightened ability as a form of um, self-identity, but also as a, as a kind of form of self-reflection, right? So is this a kind of the creation of a kind of depoliticized de contemplative space? Is it alternatively um, simply a kind of echo chamber in which the model established by the self-limiting enlightenment monarch functions as a kind of role model, if you like, that is then interjected by the enlightened nobility? Um, or is it something more? Now, I think a lot depends on what we want to get out of what, you know, I think, and I think Bruce here sort of touched on something that's, I have to perhaps even think some more about, which is how to think about this sort of this transitional moment, right? Is it a, a late in enlightenment? Is it a proto-romanticism? And do we even need to, 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 to characterize it in terms of transition? The reason I'm invested in transition is that to some extent, is that there's a wonderful kind of um, converge, convergence between the, the, the actual geopolitical moment in which the Caucasus is quite literally transitioning from Persian hegemony to Russian, right? And at that same moment, there's also a kind of a turn that's happening in Russian literature, right? Um, facilitated by what we, you know, generally by sentimentalism towards something other than uh, 18th century classicism, right? So there's a kind of nice mirroring of the literary and the, and the geopolitical there that's happening. Uh, my investment in this is, I think, to try and see if there is something like uh, the possibility of something like, you know, the emergence of something like a, um, an, an incipient discourse of autonomy that is not yet aesthetic autonomy, but, but which functions as a kind of ethical autonomy, right, which is then going to be filled with different kinds of symbolic meanings over the course of the next coming decades, right? So Pushkin already reading this text is already thinking in terms of possibility of an aesthetic autonomy, even though in fact the text doesn't necessarily pro proclaim it, right? So that's the kind of the turn that I want to read. And I think it depends on where we want to put the emphasis. If we're invested in reducing or equating Russian literature, particularly of the 18th century, with the state as an expression of the state, you can find it, right? But if you want to see the moments of fracture, Right? A fracture that, that, that is made available by a discourse that is in, in fact initiated by the state, but which the state no longer entirely controls, then perhaps we have you know, the possibility of some, some kind of space of, of movement, right? which I think that, um, that, that, that the kind of Horatian discourse of Dirjavid is making to some extent available. Um, and I'm sure Kirill will have more to say about that. The second question that 
uh, to very quickly then turn to Bruce's point, uh, I think you've raised lots of really rich points here that I have to think about. Um, I don't do very enough with either geopoetics or with land and territory in this paper. And I admit it because in fact, the term geopoetics is one that I'm going to actually develop much more extensively in the second chapter, in the later chapters, in which I look at specifically romantic texts. And in fact, my argument is that there's a kind of transition from a purely allegorical understanding of landscape to something like um, an aesthetic one, right? But, the, but the, that aesthetic understanding of landscape is going to allow for a, 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 the search for a new kind of symbolic ground for the political, right? Uh, and that's something that I, I find in the text by Pushkin and Lermontov, as well as, uh, and this is important because in fact, I didn't talk about Georgian materials in this paper at all. Uh, in Georgian romantic poetry, by figures like Grigol Orbeliani, Alexandre Chavchavadze, and uh, Nikolos Baratashvili, who are in close dialogue with their Russian counterparts, as well as with European, Polish, French, and other sources, as well as looking back to the Persian. So it's a, it's a very rich uh, cocktail of, 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 of texts that I'm thinking about. Uh, what makes, to finally, the point I'll make is about Ararat, and what makes Awai through Ararat, initially, this is going, I was going to include a Georgian text, right? But I, I realized that the Georgian texts of this sort of period are still invested in a kind of dynastic understanding of sovereignty, right? Uh, for obvious reasons, because these texts are primarily written by Russian uh, Georgian noblemen who are very close to the ruling Georgian dynasty. And I wanted to bring in the subaltern Armenian voice, right? In order to suggest a somewhat more or, or utopian or radical alternative to the kind of status quo of geopolitics. Uh, that we find in the other texts. And that's where the geo, the, I, so I, I'm looking forward to a more sort of extensive elaboration of the geopoetical. And also I agree the different ways in which customary law um, are going to function as, uh, as, 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 liter, as, a, as a properly, lit, as an object of literary reflection. Because I think that's absolutely crucial for almost all of these uh, literary texts, both Russian and Georgian. Um, all the way to, say, for example, Tolstoy in the late 19th century, as well as Vajap Shavela, the great Georgian poet, also writing in the late 19th century. These are all figures who are trying to think about natural law in um, partly in their specificity as local custom, but also through the lens of older kind of 18th century notions of, of, uh, uh, of natural law, uh, of the state of nature. So they're, they're acutely aware of that European political you know, theory of uh, traditional political theory going back to Hobbes or uh, down to Rousseau as they're trying to think through this question of, of local customary law. So all of that's going to be in the book. <laughs> well, look, we've, we've gone on now. We haven't let the audience speak for so yeah. long. Um, we are set up for questions in the chat or if someone wants to raise their hand, we can see how we're doing. Uh, let's start with Kirill. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know if I can uh, add a lot to to uh, Harsh's fantastic talk and Elias and Bruce's uh, fantastic remarks, but uh, grateful for, uh, to Harsha for bringing up my work and just to kind of to, to meet this challenge, right? Uh, uh, um, as far as, as, as uh, Dirjavin is concerned on the whole issue of the ethical autonomy, I think kind of, I agree with Ilya basically, and I, I think that the most striking uh, 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 one of the most striking things about how this ode is organized, and this is something that we discussed actually with in, in one of our uh, online discussions of this text, <clears throat> is that the person who is autonomous from politics and the favorite who is conquering the Caucasus are obviously one of the same person. They just physically uh, overlap. It's the same kind of actor. And the Dirjavin's pathos is precisely in saying that, okay, you've been the favorite, and now you are disgraced, so be ethically autonomous with a promise that you might actually go, go back to being favorite. This is the wheel that it shows, right? So you have to be both. This is the Roman idea of the Cincinnatus, right? The Stoic as a figure of power. But um, uh, kind of moving to stuff that I know much less about it, which is uh, uh, much, that's why it's much more interesting to me right now, 
uh, and kind of basing on kind of my first attempts to actually uh, uh, read something from, from anthropology and the drawing on Bruce's remarks, uh, uh, I'm wondering, I was struck by the Narezhne quote about how you might think they don't have politics, but they actually do. Uh -huh. uh, and this was a fantastic moment, which reminded me of what David Graeber and David Wengrow uh -huh. called the, the indigenous critique. So the whole idea that there is a particular optics, which Harsha referred to in, in, in the talk, that from an enlightened perspective, you might think of those uh, uh, groups and communities as pre-political, but let's not do that. So what Graeber and Wengrow say is that let's kind of do away with this assumption that those communities that are being colonized are somehow inferior. Let's not presume that. Let's not think that. And once we, we uh, are free from that assumption, what we see is not just a, a some kind of a different way of existence, but what we see as a, a forms of self-consciousness, of intellectual forms and conscious political choices, made, collective political choices made by communities about how to organize things. So that is kind of what, what my question would be about. Do can we? And this is this is might be the alternative to looking for. Mm -hmm to looking at the superfluous man as the alternative to, to the empire. Maybe yeah. the alternative is the, the collective actors, right? Who have their own communities that have developed their own alternative ways of organizing things. So I'm wondering if what I haven't read the Nerezny text, I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to doing it at some point. But my question would be, uh, I guess, uh, is this what we are seeing? Because I'm also looking at it in, in on different texts. Are we seeing... Uh, kind of Russophone authors or yeah. observers who are actually uh, making vocal kind of a, a an indigenous critique. The fact that there are communities within the scope of imperial conquest that have actually have alternative, less coercive, less violent ways of uh, organizing community. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question, Kirill. In a in a, in a sense, I've I've been, um, you know, I, I think the texts that I foregrounded largely focus on, on some notion of individual aesthetic autonomy, right, or of individual agency, and I think that arguably those are the limits, not just of these authors, but also of the specific forms, the aesthetic forms that they're practicing. So whether it's a certain kind of stoic stoically infused, uh, you know, ode in the case of Dirijavin or the kind of picaresque adventure novel, right? Uh, the, if the, the essential, essentially there's a sense of a reduction to lichness, right? Certain notion of the individual understood in, in stoic terms or in picaresque terms, but, but, uh, but, but a relative absence of community, which I think is what you're looking for. Um, so the question is really how, how to sort of recreate that archive or extend the archive in order to be able to locate these texts, right? And I, I suspect that one would have to look beyond the kind of the elite enlightenment and elite romantic texts, um, because the elite enlightenment texts are largely written by state functionaries. The romantic texts are also written by state functionaries, but and I'm talking about the Georgian as well as the Russian, right? And so the problem then becomes, where do you locate these texts? that would allow for some notion of collective self-management or self-emancipation. Uh, or, or self I have, if, if I were to answer your question, I would look in two places. One would be the text written by the, um, the naives, the deputies of Imam Shamil in the Northeast Caucasus during the period from the 1820s to the 1840s. These are, these are written generally in Arabic, um, you know, um, during the during the decades in which Imam Shamil uh, it was essentially seeking to establish, and this is interesting, a transition from kind of customary rule to something like a proto-Islamic state, right? And in those texts, you see actually something very interesting happening, which is that there are actually two struggles happening at the same time. One is a resistance using political Islam as a resistance to Russian rule, but also the imposition of Sharia law on the Chechens and Dagestanis who don't necessarily want to live by, by, by Sharia law, right? And they actually are much more in, invested in customary law in, in contradistinction to Sharia, right? And that's where their notion of self-identity actually is asserted, right? So that would be one place to look. The second place to look 
Uh, and I, I don't know if I'm going to get to all of this in my book. I mean, I, it has it has its limits, right? The second place to look would be the um, art, the, the 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 literary production, often sung poetry, of the Armenian and Georgian uh, tradesmen and artisans of the cities of South Caucasus. This was a highly sophisticated corpus of texts written often to kind of Persianate or Persian Turkic Islamic uh, musical modes, right? Which celebrate certain notions of guild culture, right? And of a kind of um, ethical aesthetic autonomy often understood in kind of hedonistic and even dan dandyist terms, right? In opposition to conventions of parsimony and uh, um, self-constraint, right? And these, there's an enormous boom in these texts. They actually enter print culture around the time of uh, uh, the, uh, the Viceroy Varensov. And they're they become published in both Armenian and Georgian, and I suspect probably in, in uh, Turkic as well. Um, and they're actually, they're, they're, they're all actually housed in this wonderful library in Tbilisi. And so that would be the other place to look. And in fact, these artisans, launched the first general strike uh, in the South Caucasus, long before the, the um, you know, Baku becomes the sort of the center for, you know, the workers' movement in the late 19th century. These uh, Armenian and Georgian artisans of Tiflis, in fact, mobilize against the Russian uh, colonial authority in the mid 19th century. So that would be another place to look. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much, Harsha. Um, I was really interested in your pairing of Derjavin's text with the Nadezhny and the Armenian figure. And I was wondering if you could, um, if you could venture to say on the basis of just these examples, um, you know, what role did marginalized voices within the Russian empire play in the Russian Georgian encounter. Um, because it seems like you're making some um, really wonderful and rich arguments about the importance of the Russia Georgia encounter in the formation of um, the idea of the aesthetic mm -hmm. in Russia. Um, so I'm just really interested to, to hear your current thoughts mm -hmm. um, again on the basis of these examples of the Nadezhny as a Ukrainian right. uh, and then this um, sort of shadowy Armenian, you know, how- Right. You know, thanks, Julia. That's a, it's a great question. And I, in a sense, I'll, I'm, my answer would be to be, just build a little bit on what I just said to Kirill. You know, when, at the beginning of, of when I started researching it, I mean, and I spent a long time studying the Georgian language, so I've, you know, an investment in now finishing the book based primarily on Georgian texts. Uh, but, you know, one of the problems I've had with, with the original formulation, which is still there in the subtitle, Russian-Georgian Encounter, is that it becomes a binary model, right? And with all binary models, you have a certain kind of easy and even seductive kind of both political and ethical opposition between, you know, the, the, you know, the, the lumbering Russian bear and the feisty Georgian, uh, you know, underdog, right? And with easy kind of opposition of, of, of good and bad and, and unequal asymmetrical relations. Um, and the problem, I mean, there are many problems with that model. One is that in fact, and I think I can say this without getting into too much trouble with the, the Georgians, if not in the audience, but in the future, which is that Georgian culture and literature evolved in the modern era in very close dialogue with Russian models, which were largely understood to be pan-European models of modernity, both political and literary, right? So that's one problem with that binary model. But the second one, and this is, you know, I'm turning to you, Julian, your question, is that it's only by looking at the, at the diversity of empire that you actually get a sense of all the actors involved, right? Particularly in a place like the Caucasus. And um, so you have this figure like, you know, the Ukrainian, Russell or Ukrainian, who works for the imperial bureaucracy. You have a large number of Armenians. In fact, as, a, as you may know, right, Tiflis was a predominantly Armenian city in the 19th century. It was, in fact, into, into the early 20th. Um, and so one of my challenges, which I don't believe I'm going to be able to uh, face full on without another 25 years of language training, which I'm not planning to undertake, 
is that in fact a lot of the most interesting texts that I need to think about are also written in other languages, right? Like Dagestani Arabic or Armenian um, and so forth. And I'm, I'm, luckily a lot of this material is translated into Russian or English. Uh, and so I've been working with those translations. Um, but I actually think that the Armenian texts are interesting for two reasons. One is because they are a very powerful economic and cultural presence in, in the South Caucasus. But secondly, for the reasons that I, I mentioned at the top, which is that they are deterritorialized. And so they allow us to think about, and this is maybe the, I still believe, reasonably compelling conclusion that Bruce was, was somewhat, I think, uh, impatient with, which is that it allows us to think about um, the modern era in terms other than imperial domination or national self um, self affirmation, right? So, I mean, th those are the two stories of modernity: imperial domination or national self determination, right? It's still being worked out in Russia and Ukraine today, right? And the question that I would have is, what other stories can we find, right? What are these third or fourth or fifth stories that would that would allow us to get out of this, you know, this Gordian knot of empire and nation as the two normative structures of modern political life? And so that's what I think the Armenians sometimes give us because they are a deterritorialized force. It's also what many of the peoples of the North Caucasus give us as well, right? As being so-called pre-political, right? Or non-state actors. Uh, so an ideal project would be to include all of this, but I'll try and do what I can in the next year. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are almost, unless there's another question, we've applied on the audience's uh, kindness for a longer than usual period. Yes. Any other things coming up on the horizon? Any final words? Okay. Well, then, if not, let's thank our great speaker and uh, hope that he comes back again soon.